The biggest deficit on record, the biggest debts for a generation. This surely is not a budget this government ever expected to hand down, but tomorrow it will. Debt is expected to exceed a trillion dollars, a deficit above 200 billion. We're about to see the biggest spending package in our history. So one way or another, this will impact you. It's designed to get Australians working and spending again. But will it work? Will you win? or will you lose out? This is your 2020 budget special and you've got loads of questions. So let's get you some answers. Welcome to Q&A. Hey there, welcome to the program. Joining me tonight, Senior Economist at Deloitte Access Economics, Nikki Hutley. In Canberra, Assistant Minister for Financial Services, Jane Hume, who's responsible for superannuation. Business leader and founder of Red Balloon, Naomi Simpson, is here. Also in Canberra, the Shadow Treasurer, Jim Chalmers. And Jane Holton is a former Director of the World Health Organisation. She was also Secretary to both the Finance and Health Departments here at home. And she's currently leading the global race to find and distribute a COVID vaccine. Please make all of them feel welcome. And later tonight, a very special musical tribute from Mahalia Barnes and friends. They're standing by in honour of a great Australian who died last week. Uh, they will be strong, they'll be invincible, and I promise you they are worth waiting around for. And remember, as always, you can join the conversation on iView, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram as well. If you're getting involved on social media, we ask that you do so respectfully. Our first question tonight comes from Rachel Koch, uh, and it's on a topic before we get to the budget that's captivating the world right now. Hi, uh, my question for the panel is, what do you think the impact will be on Trump's campaign if he is unable to attend scheduled rallies and debates? Will this help or hurt his cause? Jane Holton. Well, I think the thing we know about Donald Trump is he knows how to use every single means of communication. Tweet, um, do a drive-by today for all his supporters, waving to the crowd. So, I mean, I think unless he's really, really unwell, it won't make an enormous difference, to be honest, and it certainly looks like he's on the mend. So I think he will try and turn this to his advantage. Well, what did he make of the drive-by today? I was actually really concerned by it. I was particularly concerned for the social security, the, the secret service guys who were in the front. Um, I know they were all wearing masks, but they were very close together and we know he's COVID positive. So um, I hope for their sake that they're now isolating for the next 14 days, but I was worried for their health. Naomi Simpson, do you think it's responsible for a leader to do something like that when they're COVID positive? Well, I know that we're having to work from home and learning completely different ways to work. And I think he needs to, too, quite frankly. Um, you know, and as you say, there's so many different social medias and other mediums to get. In fact, if, I think it would be refreshing if there was a different approach to campaigning in the US, especially in these last few weeks. You know, in Australia, we have the media silence, you know, 24 hours before, maybe media silence seven <laughs> days before. You're talking about America. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Nikki Hartley. Well, you're talking about a man also with a, an ego the size of a planet, basically. Um, the Zaphod people rocks of our day. Um, he's, you know, there is no stopping him and he will do whatever he wants because everything is about him. It's completely irresponsible what he did. I don't think it'll stop him in his tracks at all um, and I wouldn't write him off no matter what the polls are saying. Uh, Jane Hume, you've seen the way leaders in this country at every level have played this pretty responsibly by and large. What did you make of seeing the United States president do that? Well, I think so. They should play it responsibly. And, you know, I echo the Prime Minister's sentiments in wishing uh, President Trump and, and the First Lady a, st a speedy recovery. I think it probably will set the campaign back a little bit, but he is unstoppable. Uh, Jim Chalmers, a speedy recovery, but should it not be in a vehicle, just maybe a speedy recovery in a hospital bed? Oh, look, we want for President Trump and Mrs Trump the same speedy recovery we want for the other 7 million or so Americans who've uh, contracted the, the virus. Uh, I thought that the uh, presidential motorcade was a bit disturbing and it was a bit disappointing. I think leaders should set a better example than that. Uh, obviously, the president's uh, SUV is uh, bulletproof, but it's not virus-proof. Uh, and I have the same view that Jane has, Jane Holton has, uh, which is that I hope that uh, the, the others in the car are being provided the appropriate level of care. All right, let's take our next question tonight. It's from Robert Milgate in the studio. Hello, my question is to Minister Jane Hume. Insecurity is one of the worst things anyone could suffer 
especially the insecurity of what a government may do. Why won't the Morrison government publicly uh, guarantee publicly that Australia is most disadvantaged, especially people on the disability support pension or job seeker won't be scapegoats as a result of COVID-19? After all, it wasn't them who created or, or um, introduced it to society. Jane Hugh. Robert, thank you very much for your question and I can assure you that the Morrison government is committed to looking after all Australians from, uh, and from all backgrounds. I think that what we've seen throughout this crisis is an unprecedented level of government support, uh, whether it be for those who are employed or employers through the Job Keeper program or through the Job Seeker program, uh, the, the doubling of support in Job Seeker. Now, that program has been extended uh, beyond the six months that it was originally set out to uh, to apply. It's been extended to the end of December and I think that that should give some comfort to a number of people that are, are still looking for work. But it's important to find the right balances between incentivising people to get back out to work and go and look for work as well as providing that important social safety net that's underpinned by a sense of decency and fairness. Yeah, Jane, I don't think anyone would think that $40 a day is, is, is at all decent. And you know that we've recently um, done some modelling on behalf of ACOS that shows that removing the supplement too early, uh, at, as, as is currently planned by the government, is actually going to create, you know, $145,000... Mm. Uh, 145,000 job losses, both this year and financial year and, and next, massively detract from economic growth. So... We also know that people on new starts, their standard of living has gone backwards relative to everybody else, including pensioners, by 40% over the last 25 years. 40%. We are absolutely marginalising these people who not only have a greatly disadvantaged, but if we give them more permanently, they actually stimulate the economy. So it's a win mm. for, for dignity and it's, and it's a, a win for the economy. It's, um, and, and creating uncertainty by not extending it is actually making it harder for those people to make decisions. I, I well, think Nikki, they're I really think good. The Prime Minister I... has already said that that will be considered later in the end. Minister Rustin has said that. And I think D that Jane, your you, report... Just that, can, can you just explain why it's not in the budget? Obviously, there is this level of insecurity for people that might be wanting some clarity on that. Could you share with us why it's not part well, of the budget? Well, the extended amount, of course, is... Is, um, is in the budget, uh, what the permanent amount will be, what this, you know, the change in the structure of, of, um, of Job Seeker will be, will be announced later in the year, and that will you know, take into account the economic circumstances that we find ourselves in in the time. I think you've seen that in the past uh, eight or nine months that this government has an ability to act swiftly and in response to the circumstances that it finds themselves in, and that's an appropriate response to do so. I am concerned, though, at looking at Job Seeker just in an individual silo and particularly in the context of the budget of course when you're trying to generate aggregate demand it's not just about one single measure it's but how those measures interact mm. and that's why the budget will contain not just information about job seeker and the extension of job seeker but also job keeper infrastructure investment support for businesses because it's about creating an aggregate demand rather than just you know, the effectiveness of one single measure. And, in fact, the report that you did only really concentrated on that one single measure. But, Jane, Hol Jane Holden, at this point, we don't know what either major parties are no. committed to longer term in terms of this social safety net. Do you see any excuse as to why we can't know from both of these major parties so what Robert, they want to do? So, Robert, Robert, $40 a day is not enough to live on. It's not enough to live on. We've known that. I've been saying this now for the last couple of years. It is just time we actually got with the program and actually de dealt with it because we cannot ask people in this day and age to live on $40 a day. And I understand the need to be fiscally responsible, but we, we're looking here to give people confidence as we come out of what's been a really difficult time for people. And I, so I really feel for people who are really worried about December because they fear going back to $40 what, a day. What, what should the rate be, do you think? I mean, you, you were the head of the Department of Finance. What do you think it should be? Um, well, it's certainly not $40 a day and it probably is something a bit lower than we're seeing now and in terms of the job seeker amount. I mean, I think if you look at the... The, the issues around poverty and where the numbers are. We've had to do what we've had to do, and I really support what the government has done, but it's probably, as uh, the Assistant Minister has said, it's somewhere that still provides incentive, but enables people to live with dignity, look after themselves and look after their kids. Uh, Naomi, can you put a figure on dignity? Well, I, I think there's two words that I want to pick up. One was confidence, and the other thing is the ability to plan, Robert. So it's very hard for 
your particular circumstances, our community circumstances, but also our small businesses to be able to plan. Many of our small businesses who have worked very hard for a very long period of time now find themselves out of work, obviously through no fault of their own. But with the structures going on between the different states having different sets of rules, whether you're a, a business that's serving national customers, international customers, local customers, or within a state, they too cannot plan. With the ever-changing landscape of different regulations, different levels of governance. So on a, very, on a personal level, on a family level, for people who are living on disabilities. But then there's also those who have for a very long period of time worked very, very hard for this country to provide employment and they too can't plan. And, you know, we'd like to see that we can kickstart this economy by providing jobs as well as support and dignity, I think, is a very, very important work. Jim Chalmers, I know you've been trying to get in. What, what will Labor commit to in terms of the, the long-term rate for New Start or whatever it's going to be called in the future? Well, we need to see, Hamish, what we inherit from the government. As Jane Hume said, uh, there's no clarity yet until the, towards the end of the year. Uh, on what the uh, new rate of job seeker will be. Uh, we agree with all the other panellists that it needs to be higher than $40 a day. I thought Nikki's contribution in particular was absolutely bang on. This is about dignity for people. It's about being out, people being able to support themselves while they look for work. But it's also good for the economy, which has been starved of spending power, not just during COVID-19, but before that as well. So Jane Hume talked about... With, with respect, uh, though, Jim Chalmers, I think the government is now acknowledging it will be more than what it does, so there's no argument there. And I'm just wondering how long it's going to take for Labor to show its hand and tell us what it thinks the amount should be. Well, the point that I'm making, Hamish, is the government has the opportunity in the budget this time tomorrow uh, to tell us what kind of rate Labor would inherit if it came to government and also tell us the conditions of the budget. We still don't know... Uh, what the final budget position is. And so those are important things for us to factor in. The point that I'm making, I'm trying to agree with Jane Hume here in saying it does matter how much demand is in the economy. And one of the consequences of pulling out JobSeeker, cutting JobSeeker from the last weekend of last month and also cutting JobKeeper, is that hundreds of millions of dollars fewer uh, per fortnight are circulating in, in our economy and our economy's not strong enough to deal with that yet. So we've got to make sure that as the government cuts this support, it doesn't actually cruel the recovery before it even gets going. But to finish on Robert's question, Robert was actually asking about the disability support pension and other types of support, not just uh, job seeker. And I think it's important to recognise, Robert, if you're anything like me, it probably drives you crazy as it drives me crazy when I hear people say that this virus doesn't discriminate. Sure, as we've seen with President Trump, anyone can catch COVID-19, but it does discriminate. The effects of this virus uh, hurt the people who are already most vulnerable and the people who are already most uh, insecure in our society, and the budget tomorrow night needs to recognise that too. OK, let's take our next question. It's, a, it's from Daniel Barnett in the studio. Hi, guys. Um, if the government's proposed stage two tax cuts are passed in full, someone on $200,000 a year would get a 4.5% tax cut, but people on $45,000 a year will receive a cut of just half a percent. It's estimated that these cuts will cost upwards of $20 billion in the first two years. Does the panel think that tax cuts for the rich is really the best way of stimulating the economy at a time when one in 10 people are out of work and job seeker is being cut. Naomi Simpson, tax cuts. Yeah, uh, the, the thing that I see is that what business needs now is customers. How are we going to get customers so that they can spend? And it's actually very cyclical. So we hear we need jobs. So first of all, we do need to create jobs. The only way to create jobs is to have confidence in the economy. And the thing is that when we think about tax cuts, we have to give businesses confidence that they can invest in the future. And then it becomes cyclical. So one tax element like that in isola isolation without looking at all of the tax structures. So I think about payroll tax. So at a certain point in a small business life, it's a disincentive to grow. All of a sudden you get so big, like I'm not talking that big, but the governance and the requirements, and you can, 
is, is quite material. So payroll tax was invented in 1941 for child endowment to support people who needed, you know, their husbands had gone off, off, off to war and they needed to raise their children in 19... Uh, it, and then it was nationalised and sent to the feds and sent back to the states in 1971. And I think if we want to stimulate the economy, we've really got to look at how we have an overall tax restructure. Do you, do you think it's easy to justify that, though, when you are cutting things out, when you're reducing JobKeeper, reducing JobSeeker, there is the insecurity that we heard about then. Is it still so, justifiable to say to someone on $100,000 or $150,000 or $200,000 a year that you're going to get a, a tax break? Well, for a start, we do know that there is job growth in certain areas and there's massive job losses in other areas. So there are... And we need to reskill our people. So what I would like to see is that we're investing in an apprenticeship program that is beyond what they called for yesterday, which is about 100,000 apprenticeships. I would like to see that, we, that they move it beyond the trades and into technical skills. So, so Nikki Hartley, do, do the tax cuts make sense? Um, look, I, I personally... I'm not in favour of them and, and for the reasons that you've outlined. I mean, you know, the old saying, lies, damn lies and statistics. Uh, you, can, you can manipulate the way you present these tax cuts uh, to say that they're fair and that even under, under stage three that the top 10% will still be paying a certain percentage of, of, of the tax base, but they're actually earning more. Of, of, so it's, it's how much you're paying proportionate to how much you're earning that I want to look at. Stage two, look, I wouldn't die in a ditch over it, but it wouldn't be my first thing and, and I certainly wouldn't have it at the expense of everything else. Stage three, you know, if you flatten the tax rate, by definition, it is less fair, it's less progressive. So, but this you know, is, is that who we this... want to be? And particularly in a time when yeah. we're worried about revenue, we're getting, raising debt, we've heard we've got massive debt. But this debt. isn't about stage three, let's be clear, and there's a whole lot of a conversation we could have about stage three. Well, there's which some reports tonight saying that stage three won't be included. In yeah, yeah. So, so, and for those who weren't across what stage three was, it takes out a whole uh, layer. Mm. But to your question, um, we know people on lower incomes, if you put money in their pocket, they'll spend it. We know that if you put money in the pocket of people on higher incomes, they're more inclined to save it. So if we're on about stimulating the economy, you target people on lower incomes. That's just the facts of the matter. There is, however, a problem we have in Australia, which is this issue of bracket creep. And so what those tax cuts are trying to do, I think, is balance those two things. The question is, where are your priorities? And it goes to Nikki's point. If your priority is about spending, you target on lower income people, uh, and not necessarily on higher incomes. Yeah, we know that people will save. We know that the, the savings rate went up to 20% in the June quarter. It's it's not what you... If you're simulating the economy, and I guess that's the point, is what's your objective what's in all your of objective? this? Is it, is it something you should be bringing board, forward if you're worried about stimulating the economy? No, give it to people who spend it. And we have yep. absolutely seen that in spades. We've had the data broken down for us that shows that it's the it's all the supplements that the government has provided. That's what's got spent in the economy and kept us, you know, from being in, in even more dire state than we are. And it's so, $12 billion. Let's mm. be clear, though, what the tax cut... I understand mm. the numbers are about $12 billion. So whilst you're bringing down JobKeeper and JobSeeker, $12 billion will come back through tax cuts the question is how much of it will be saved and how much of it will be spent. So just, Hamish, I think just it's really on that important point, to come in here, yeah, if you don't mind, if I can come in here, because let's face it, these tax cuts are in fact already legislated and the government makes no apologies for ever, will make any more, more apologies for uh, for wanting to allow people to keep more of the money that they earn. Sure, we but took with respect, that legislation, this is, this is we took that legislation the, to the last timing. election. This is we about the it to timing the last election. and whether you should bring it forward. So can you explain why now? Why are you deciding to bring this forward? Well, I'm not going to speculate about what might be in the budget tomorrow night, but what I will tell you is that those tax cuts have already been legislated. Labor supported those tax cuts and supported the legislation. And, uh, and, and, and what we know is that the progressivity, uh, you know, the, the progressiveness of the tax system remains. We'll still find that the top 5% of taxpayers pay, uh, you know, the, by, the, by far the most amount of because tax... Because they earn the most. Tax. <laughs> yeah. But that's exactly right. And simplifying the tax system by removing that 37 cents in the dollar bracket will in fact benefit 94% of Australians will pay no more than 30% top marginal tax rate. That's got to be a good thing. Do we'll never apologise for allowing more Australians to keep more money in their pockets. It actually brings about uh, financial resilience and confidence in the economy. Uh, Jim Chalmers, uh, a lot of Australians have had a pretty tough year. Is Labor going to stand in the way of some tax cuts potentially by Christmas, according to some reports tonight? Well, we support the first two stages of the tax cuts and we support 
uh, stage two being brought forward, so long as there's additional tax relief uh, for low-income earners as well, for all the reasons the other panellists have talked about. Uh, if there are going to be tax cuts, if they're directed at people uh, on low and middle incomes, they're more likely to be spent in the economy and people uh, are more likely to need that uh, additional uh, help. Uh, so, yes, we support the first two stages. We haven't been supportive of the third stage because that third stage is the least responsible, uh, least affordable, least fair and least likely to be effective in the economy. We've made those views clear for some time now. Uh, Jane Holton talked about the withdrawal of JobKeeper and, and, and being replaced in some part by these tax cuts. It's really important to remember uh, that for a worker who might be getting $50 a fortnight out of this uh, these tax cuts, if we're predicting what might happen tomorrow night, uh, many of them, millions of them, have actually just lost $300 a fortnight in JobKeeper, so they're $250 in the hole. We need to remember that. Mm. Naomi JobKeeper, talked about... Hang, hang just on, let me make Jim, my final job, point there. Hang on, JobKeeper has my not final been, point cut, is, been extended, and you know that. It's, it's just been tapering cut by $300 down. And a you fortnight, agreed Jane. with the tapering down of JobKeeper six months ago. No, we said it had to be tailored to the conditions in the economy, and the economy is still weak. It's and being it's been cut. extended as it's well being as cut. tapered. Jane, it's, it's been, been cut from $1,500 to $1,200 well. a fortnight. It's been extended for Jane, more than six and, months. Jane Jim. and Jim, I don't, I don't think we need a repeat of the Trump-Biden debate. So no, but I need to make my final point, just... Hamish, that Jane interrupted. It's gone from $1,500 to $1,200 a fortnight. But my final point is this, and Let's it's to agree question. with Naomi. It's to agree with Naomi. Uh, tax cuts on their own aren't a substitute for a more comprehensive plan uh, for the economy. We can't have the budget tomorrow night to just be another grab bag of headlines. It needs to be a comprehensive plan and tax cuts on their own are not enough. OK, let's take our next question. It's from David Coddington via Skype in Victoria. David, thanks for joining us. Uh, I know you and your partner, Marco, have found yourselves in a pretty difficult set of circumstances. Can you just explain where you found yourselves? Uh, my partner, Marco, he works in hospitality. He's here on an immigration visa. Uh, we're doing the partnership. So anyway, obviously COVID hit. He lost his job in uh, March this year. I'm in the fitness industry. I also stopped working around that time as well because gyms are closed in Melbourne. So since then, the only thing we're getting is government, uh, the job keeper for myself, uh, and Marco's eligible for nothing. And I know you've had to make some choices. You've had a bit of help with your rent, uh, but you've also had some difficult conversations. Where's that led you? Well, he's sort of he's stuck in a situation now where he's got no family, no friends, no job, no money, no chance of getting back to Italy. And a couple of weeks ago, he said he didn't want to live like this anymore. And that whole conversation got a little bit darker into his mental health. Since then, he's a little bit better, but that was a really rough couple of weeks to go through. And, and tell me about the decision to withdraw super. Was that done because you wanted to use your money to invest or something like that? Or, or, or was it more <laughs> out of the sort of desperation that you found yourselves in? Well, you just know on $1,500 a fortnight and paying rent, living in a major city, that's not going to go far enough. And so we need that to live on until hospitality or PT uh, opens up again. It'll be nine months by the end from when we lost our job till maybe working again. And so your question for the panel tonight is about your decision to withdraw super. What, what's your question? Well, we sort of had no other choice. So put yourself in Marco's shoes. He pays taxes. Uh, he is an Australian person. He's living here. Um, why isn't the government sort of helping them out more? And where does that leave us in the future? Because we've had to bite into it. Nikki. Yeah, look, um, I've, I've been against this policy right from the start because I think accessing super, particularly young people who are taking it out, means that they have, you know, just blown away their future retirement savings. When we had restrictions in place, they were for a damn good reason, but government-imposed restrictions mean that government has to help people out. There are far too many people who have fallen through the cracks. There are many people who have the same sorts of stories like you. And I can tell you, in my own family, my son-in-law lost his job very early on. He worked in hospitality. He's been lucky enough to find something since. But because his, my daughter, his partner, earned just to the cut-off, they, he was entitled to nothing. And there are so many families where two-income households are necessary to pay the rent or the mortgage. 
and that's where these people get into to trouble. There's 98,000 temporary um, you know, uh, visa holders who, who are entitled to nothing. The charities have been overrun by trying to help them. There are too many Australians who have fallen through the cracks and we've stopped talking about them. We're arguing about JobKeeper and JobSeeker and things being cut back and we've kind of forgotten. We were outraged at the start there were so many people who weren't getting support. We need to remember that there are a lot of people getting absolutely nothing at all. Uh, Jane Hume, do you accept that there are some people like uh, David who, and Marco who have made these decisions really out of desperation rather than being strategic with their finances? Uh, can I first of all say, you know, David and Marco, I feel for you coming from Victoria. Myself, I know the pain that, it, that Victorians are going through. In fact, the vast majority of correspondence that I have to my office, which is in Bridge Road in Richmond, which is, you know, it's like tumbleweeds going down that, that retail strip these days. Uh, the vast majority of the correspondence I have to my office is actually asking for a third tranche of superannuation to be made available. Now, the early release of superannuation scheme... Of, but doesn't has, that say something about the supports that are already being made available by the government if these people are, are in such desperate uh, situations in Victoria that they want a third tranche of early access to super? Yes, I think that the second round of lockdowns and the excessive restrictions in Victoria have been so damaging, not just to people's businesses, not just to people's livelihoods, but also to their mental health as well. Certainly the early release of superannuation scheme has been very successful. Around 2.8 million Australians have taken out about $33 billion of superannuation in uh, the past uh, nine months alone. Now, to put that into context, uh, $33 billion is about the same amount of money that the superannuation industry charged in fees last year alone. It's just over 1% of the entire system and it's about a quarter of the amount that Australians put in to superannuation uh, just last year. And we know that the vast majority of people overwhelmingly use that money to pay down debt, uh, you know, pay for bills, pay off credit cards. We know 137,000 credit cards were cut up okay. last well, month alone. With, with respect, Minister, right we're thing. pretty familiar with these points that have been made and I ask you whether you, you accept that some people really have done this out of desperation. Do you acknowledge that? We put that in there as a, the, the reason why the early release of super scheme was was initiated was a part of the safety net package were for people that wanted to access their own savings. Now we know that it comes at a trade off. That trade off, uh, you know, we directed as many people as we could to the ASIC website, that Money Smart website, so they could see exactly what it would cost their retirement savings in the future. We know that a lot of young people accessed their superannuation. As Nikki said, the good news about that, of course, is that they have potentially 40 years in the workforce that they could make up the difference. Our focus now has to be on getting those young people back into work so they can continue contributing to superannuation and make up the difference and to give them more opportunities okay. to do so. Jane Holton, if this is a trade-off, is it worth it for the individual? What's it worth for an individual longer term? Yeah, so, I mean, the cost of people's retirement savings, I think, is very significant. But in David and Marco's case, and I... Uh, David... Uh, Please give our very best to Marco because he's been placed in an invidious position. There are um, many, many people around the country who are here on temporary uh, visas. My daughter-in-law is one of them and eligible for nothing. And so you've probably, uh, without knowing all of your circumstances, done what is the prudent thing in, in the context because you've had to put food on the table. We understand that. And uh, let's be honest, your health and your welfare is the most important thing. But I think the longer term cost is something we're going to be considering for a really long time. And so I am disappointed that uh, at a time, particularly when we discovered that these programs ended up costing loss less than was estimated at the beginning, that there wasn't some flexibility shown for this category of person, because this is really hard. And um, David, I might be uh, doing you a disservice, but I'm guessing you're not that young a person. Uh, so you don't have as long to make up those retirement savings. Um, but in the short term, can you please focus on your wellbeing and Marco's wellbeing? If people are making up extra in their superannuation yeah. to, for, the, for the shortfall. It also means that they're not spending as much for for a much longer period right. of time, so you're dragging right. on, on growth. So what, but what's point. this going to cost us is, as a country if we have a whole raft of people that down the track have less in their... That's you're saying this is a big impact on their that's individual right. retirement savings. That's right. What's it going to cost all so, of us longer term? So essentially, if you look at what's happened um, to the pension arrangements and people have said, and there's a whole argument which undoubtedly people will want to have about whether we should increase compulsory superannuation savings, but you're starting to see the impact of those changes. 
So you're now starting to see many more people who are actually on a combination of a pension and some private retirement savings. So that means they've got a better quality of life uh, in their older years, which is fantastic. What we really so are you, now... So do you accept the government's argument, just make up, make up this difference? For some the people, they won't be able to. We know that. For Certainly some people, for older people, we think that there will be, yeah. much, be much harder to make up. But I think yeah. you also have to consider the counter-argument, Hamish. I mean, what is the alternative? Potentially, if people couldn't access that, you know, a bit of financial buffer or, or something to pay down their debts or pay down their bills when they, you know, found themselves suddenly unemployed, they potentially might have gone to a payday lender or they would have taken out, you know, credit card debt or sold an asset that was valuable to them. People have been, have, have been given a choice whether they want to access their superannuation and some of them have taken that up. OK. Some people have no choice, Jane, and that's the point, really, that David is make, making about Marco. Uh, no doubt, David, you're a tremendous source of support to Marco, but we've got responsibilities to him as well. And too many people in this recession have been left out and left behind and they have had to turn to their superannuation in desperation. Now, the Minister for Superannuation just spoke about early access as if it's something that she's proud of. It's something that the Minister for Superannuation should be ashamed of, the fact that so much damage has been done to people's retirement incomes. A young worker who's taken out $20,000 might be $100,000 worse off uh, in retirement. That's something that, that the minister should be ashamed of. We have a minister for superannuation whose only achievement seems to have been to destroy the retirement incomes of too many workers. And the reason that that has happened is because the government hasn't supported enough workers in our economy. Uh, Marco's situation, but also aviation workers, arts and entertainment, a million casuals, all left out and left behind by the government, having to uh, ruin and raid uh, their nest egg uh, in response. And it's, it's not something that the Minister should be proud of. Well, I am proud of it, Jim, and I take umbrage to that. I, I find that quite offensive. In fact, this program has been very successful. The vast majority of correspondence I've received has, have been for people that have been grateful for the ability to access some of their own savings. Let's recall this. It's not the government's money. It's, given it's not no Labor's money. Jane. It's not unions' money. It's not even the funds' money. It's their money. It's their savings. They worked for it. They earned it. They it's their retirement, it. too. And they have chosen so to what access I see that money. Is, they have chosen to What I it. see is that small businesses, too, have had to dip into their superannuation to not just keep their families afloat, but to try and keep their businesses afloat. Very hard when they don't know, particularly in Victoria or Queensland, where they're desperate for tourism from other parts, and also Western Australian tourism. Very, very difficult. But what people forget is that small business has a choice. They don't have to show up when they've decided to open the doors. They closed it. Right, business is now closed. You can no longer, to your point, hospitality and personal training, Marco and David, they just, they're closed. Well, this is not a sustainable, for us, a sustainable way for us to move forward. Now, with these businesses, all of them are going to require governance, compliance, retraining, and also many are going to require stock. I walked into a store in Sydney because I can do that. I said, oh, you've got no stock. They said, we didn't order any because we didn't know if we'd be open. So these businesses are beginning to say it is too hard. I got a letter from one of... It's actually an email. We're quite modern now. <laughs> I got an email from... Um, at one of our chocolate um, high teas, and he's in Collins Street in Victoria. And I've worked with him for six years, and he's this beautiful, he's Belgian, he's a master chocolatier. And he wrote to me, and we've been supporting him through the out this, trying to transition his business to being online. He says, but now the chocolate is so beautiful, it will melt. And I said, it's winter in Victoria, perhaps <laughs> not. So he said, look, I just don't know if I will ever get foot traffic again. I've worked in my business for decades. It's time for me to retire. I didn't think I'd do this for 10 years. This is 10 years that he won't be contributing to his superannuation. It is pressure on our social service system, maybe not particularly him, I don't know his personal circumstance. But when we think about small business as the largest employer, if small business is unable to employ and get Marco and David back to work, which is what they want to do, then not only their superannuation will be decimated, but so will the small business owners. And it is a cycle that will end us in a long-term disaster. We need small businesses to be able to plan, to be able to open 
and to be able to do business. And if one more person says, well, go online, I promise you, not every small business can go online. OK, let's take our next question tonight. It's from Zaki Hadari in the studio. Um, my name is Zaki Haidari. I am a refugee from Afghanistan who escaped the Taliban. Despite being recognised as a refugee, I have only been granted a temporary protection visa. Makes it hard for me to gain a permanent employment and excluding me from the job keeper and the job seeker. It's much harder for others in my community, men, women, children, have been left to rely on charity to survive. None of this makes sense to me. Prime Minister Scott Morrison said, we're all, we're all in this together. But will this budget continue to leave us behind? Jane Hume. Saki, can I say that, you know, your story is indeed heartbreaking and, and you know, my sympathies are extended to you. Um, and obviously, you know, there has been some hiccups in settling into Australia. I'm so sorry that after the experiences you've gone through that you've now entered our country to find us in this uh, unprecedented health crisis. Temporary visa holders, well, broadly not I'm talking temporary protection visa holders, but temporary visa holders, when they come to Australia, are unfortunately expected to be able to pay their own way. That has always been the case. I think that temporary protection visas should be um, considered differently. And, if Zaki, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to take your case offline and speak to you after the show, get the producers to connect us, and I'll have a chat with you. Jane Hume, just on this, I mean, we've, got, we've had questions about this sort of thing right throughout the pandemic. I'm just wondering why charities is the only thing that yeah. we as a nation can offer people in this situation. Surely, yes. given, given all the spending... I mean, we're about to embark on the biggest spending spree as a nation that we've ever undergone. Why can't we include some of these people? Well, Hamish, I wouldn't call it a spending spree. What we're looking to do is to cushion the blow for as many people as we possibly can to recover from the pandemic so, and then to the rebuild what the economy. What about these people? Let, let's just focus on them, please. Yeah, I mean, as I said, that, you know, temporary visa holders have always been understood to have to pay their own way in Australia and that the vast majority of support that the federal government provides has, uh, has been for Australian citizens and, and permanent residents. Uh, there has been some supports provided by the states, um, certainly by universities I know for uh, international students and also by community groups okay. uh, for, for temporary protection visa Absolutely. holders so and temporary, those, temporary visa holders. Those, those, those um, charities, and I know this firsthand from a lot of my friends who, who are working at the coalface are saying we don't have enough money, that demand has gone up 300%, no. and unfortunately the, the donations are going down. Welcome to our country, and I apologise that you're going through this. I wish I personally could do something to change it. I think it's disgraceful. And, you know, I'm, I'm deeply sorry. I'm, and I'm and let's be clear, there's a history to this, which we don't need to go over to here, um, but it's not the case that this was always so. Um, there were reasons that these arrangements were put in place to disincentivise people to come. Uh, that's not the situation we're in today. It's hard to get here in any way, shape or form, including Australians who want to come home can't get here. Again, I, I would argue that this is a time for some compassion. OK. Let's take our next question tonight. It's from Laura Chisnock, who's here in the studio audience with us. I'm going to come and join you, but stay at a safe distance under COVID rules. Uh, what's your question for the panel tonight? My question for the panel tonight is that pursuing gender equality outcomes has become out of reach and is exacerbated by COVID-19. In August 2020, the gender pay gap sat at 14%. To mitigate the impact of COVID-19, all levels of government have taken unprecedented action, unlocking funding and equity. In the case of superannuation, this has serious implications for women. My concern is that it has been a stopgap. It has not addressed high levels of uncertainty around our economic sovereignty, institutional financing and foreign policy. As a young professional woman, I am genuinely concerned about my future and that of our generation. What is the government doing and what will the new budget do to sort of future-proof and ensure that all women get a fair go in the post-COVID recovery? Jane Hume, to you first. 
Yes, thank you, Hamish, and, and thank you for that question. Do you know, at the beginning of this year, um, you know, one of the, I think, the, the, the proudest things for me was that we had a higher level of female participation rate in the workforce than we'd ever seen before. And we'd seen that gender pay gap come down from uh, the mid-17% down to 14.2%. That's your right. That's exactly right. We know that when more women participate in the workforce, not only do we get higher levels of productivity, but of course the gender pay gap comes down, the gender retirement cap J comes Jane down. Hume, I, suspe I suspect the questioner knows all of this, so I just want to point you to the actual question, which is about this budget. Should it sounds like you want to guarantee about or some kind of indication of how women will be recognised in this budget. Well, in fact, there is a women's economic statement that is going to be issued by Maurice Payne uh, soon after the budget, and there'll be more to say in but, that. But not in the budget? Uh, well, uh, the budget is uh, you know, not gender specific. It will affect all Australians. Mm -hmm. I think there's been some good news, though, in that the 458,000 jobs that have come back in the last three months, 60% of those went to women and 40% yeah. went to young people. That's got to be a good thing. Jim Chalmers, what would Labor do to make sure that women are prioritised in the COVID recovery? Well, I think it's really important to recognise, as the question does, uh, that this uh, COVID-19 crisis has uh, accelerated some of the challenges that we had in the economy when it comes to uh, uh, wage disparities, when it comes to superannuation. I think it's still the case that uh, women on average retire with just over half the superannuation balances of men, uh, partly because of the way the system's structured, but also because of uh, broken work patterns and the fact that it's harder and harder for women uh, to participate fully in the workforce for uh, the length of the career. So ideally in the budget, uh, we'd be recognising, for example, when it comes to women's participation, uh, that there has been uh, issues with childcare, for example. There have been issues with uh, costs of childcare. Childcare workers were among the first so, so what would uh, thrown off that? job what would, on, what would Labor do on childcare? Oh, we'll have more to say in, uh, you know, between now and the election when it comes to childcare. But I guess the point that we're making is we need to recognise that women have been disproportionately impacted uh, by this crisis. Uh, that has implications for salaries and wages, uh, for superannuation, for participation in the workforce. One of the disappointing things, as my colleague Amanda Rishworth has pointed out repeatedly, is that childcare workers were actually the first thrown off of JobKeeper. Okay. Uh, that is clearly an issue that needs to be addressed by the government. Lara, what do you do? I'm a law graduate. OK. And uh, I, I suspect you've just been told a lot of stuff you already know. Mm. Uh, do you have much optimism out of what both sides are telling you? I know a lot of me and my cohort are very disillusioned going into the graduate workforce and it's a lot of slim opportunities. And I know that women are have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. And yes, we know it's just very bleak looking at the future. The, the government's paying for, or helping to pay for apprenticeships. Would you, would you take up an apprenticeship? I think I've come this far, I can't turn back now. But it's just very disillusioning to look at knowing we'll graduate and we'll have less super and what do we want childcare and all these things we have to sort of rethink now, even though I'm only 21, knowing that the government doesn't think that women are being disproportionately affected or isn't addressing it. So this has been described as a pink recession. Do you think the recovery yeah. uh, is pink? Do you think the plans that you've heard laid I out... I think it's very women? colourblind, yes. OK. Uh, let me put that to the panel. Jane Holton, are women being sort of recognised equally in the way that we're planning to come out of this crisis? Well, uh, I think the points that have been made are absolutely right. Uh, women lost jobs disproportionately as we went into this recession. Now, the upside is that the women uh, are getting jobs earlier in the recovery, but they're part-time jobs. And the kind of jobs that we're looking for for women are, regardless of where you are in the workforce, there should be women there. So I'm looking to see whether those apprenticeships that we're hearing are going to be announced. I mean, wouldn't it be great if 50% of those apprenticeships went to women? Uh, you can immediately... Will do they? Well, the, you tell me, Hamish, I'm guessing no. I mean, all of the news coverage, all of the photo ops uh, don't seem to particularly include yeah. women. Am I just missing yeah. something here? Yeah. Well, to me, this is, a, this is, this is a not just a COVID issue. This is well before right. COVID. So I'm involved in something called the, the Financing Women's Economic Progress Index, and we have a, a whole load of pillars that we measure women's progress versus men. The biggest dis area of disadvantage, and this shows that um, we are 32 years or an entire generation away from equality, 
And that's if we keep making the progress on some of the fronts that we have been making. And, of course, things will likely slow as, as we get closer to the end. So the biggest thing there is the ratio of paid to unpaid work. Women who work and, uh, in, outside the home do twice as much work as, as, as men who, who work outside in, in a, you know, heteronormative couple. Um, yeah, because that's the way the stats work, um, unfortunately. But so what we need to do is systemically, we actually need to look at well, why do girls pursue particular careers? Why are we told that we're crap at maths when we when we start out? Why don't why aren't we doing? Why aren't there more women who will take up? A, a, you know, we talk about the tradies, and everyone says, oh well, there's going to be a, a blue recovery because only men are tradies. Why can't women be mm. tradies? Why can't we be anything yeah. we want? Why can't our employers be more flexible? Why can't we have superannuation when we go on on parental leave? Why aren't men going on parental leave more? And lots of big firms there's, are starting another, to implement these policies. There's another point so. here too, which is about youth. And coming out of university, which I'm sure it was not an inexpensive degree that you've managed to, you know, work very hard to get. And there's a request that I make of employers. I know that in placing one job ad for a graduate person, 250 applicants for that role. And that it just takes respect to make sure you get back to everybody. Yeah. You know, respect is a very important thing as we are more challenged than we've ever been before. And the other thing to say is that if everybody took on one graduate, every small business took on one graduate, we wouldn't have this issue at all. So I would like to see in the budget some stimulus to my point of extending the apprenticeships, not just being to the traditional trades, okay. but to how do we use that law degree and Can we have some better childcare, more affordable childcare, and the tax breaks that don't mean that when you work the fourth and fifth day, you're penalised. OK. And just a reminder, ABC News is also taking your questions this week about the federal budget. Uh, you can head to abc.net.au forward slash news uh, to get involved, help shape our coverage. Uh, use the hashtag Quanda and they'll try and get some answers for you on that. Our next question comes from Peter King. Thanks, Hamish. Is COVID-19 now endemic in Australia and indeed around the world? And if not, is it inevitable, similarly to chickenpox and malaria, that it will be? I'm also interested to know the panel's opinion with respect to the reality of a vaccine being discovered and distributed worldwide in some of the time frames we see reported in the media. On a daily basis, we hear six, 12, 18 months, including one world leader suggesting even sooner. What is the reality of these pronouncements becoming actual reality? Uh, Jane, we're told that this budget factors in uh, a vaccine yeah. sometime next year. Is I'm, that wise? I'm, Can we I'm told that? that as well. We'll see, won't we, what the assumption is when we uh, see tomorrow night. Look, I'm, I'm moderately optimistic that we will actually succeed in uh, discovering or creating a vaccine for COVID-19. Um, there are some 23 vaccines that are currently in human trials around the world. The not-for-profit that I lead globally has nine of those vaccines. Um, it is absolutely the case that some of those vaccine candidates will fail. We're now at the point where the rubber is hitting the road. So I'm not expecting... And remember, there, there is not a human coronavirus vaccine that has ever been created. So in terms of timetable, if some of the leading candidates were successful, and Australia's got supply agreements in relation to two specific candidates, the Oxford candidate, which I'm sure you've all heard of, and then the University of Queensland, they're on different time tables. If the Oxford vaccine succeeds, uh, there would be some vaccine imported early next year and then CSL will supply and manufacture University of Queensland later. And then the COVAX facility, which I co-chair with Dr Ngozi, um, will actually pull purchase a vaccine. So I'm optimistic we will get there on a vaccine. But when is... The $64 question, let's go buy a lottery ticket, shall we? Um, but at the moment, I would say uh, middle of next year, we should be moderately optimistic, but it's still got a way to go. Yeah, so. just, just with your sort of Department of Finance hat on that you, yes. you once had, if you get the assumption wrong on something like this, what does that do to the budget? And the numbers that we're looking at, is well, it out of the water? So I think we might have all heard um, Matthias Kuhlman, our retiring finance minister, who I work with very closely, saying this morning, and I agree with him completely, um, you can only make uh, a budget based on assumptions that are correct at the time you make it. Everything from the iron ore price uh, through to the modelling that you can do based on what you know now. So the truth of the matter is uh, we... We'll look at the budget tomorrow. There'll be a bunch of assumptions in it. If circumstances change, the numbers will change. Let's hope that they're optimistic and they're right. Uh, Jane, can I, can I, sorry, can I just ask, because my understanding is that whilst we might have a vaccine developed, 
the logistics of getting it out to everyone that's possibly yeah. going to need two or three doses. Yes, two doses. That, so what what does that time so because all of our forecasts absolutely hinge on yeah, that. Yeah, so glo global manufacturing. So if, if, if everyone thinks about this, that there are 8 billion people in the world, assume some people don't want it, fine, but let's assume you're going to make vaccine for about 8 billion people. So just do the math about how long that takes. It's quite a long time. One of the reasons we're saying that around the world the most vulnerable should be vaccinated first as opposed to wealthy countries vaccinating um, the whole country first. If you vaccinate vaccinate wealthy countries first, you will cut deaths by a third. If you vaccinate the vulnerable around the world, you will cut deaths by two thirds. Two thirds. But this is why we have to target that vaccine. Um, some vaccines are fast to make, some vaccines not so. The AstraZeneca vaccine, we would probably get enough probably by middle to the... towards the back end of next year. Just on, just on pandemic preparedness, Jim Chalmers, I, I believe Labor is going to have something to say this week about a centre for disease control. Are you saying that it, were this to happen again and Labor were in government, we'd have a very different setup? Yes, Hamish. I think we need to uh, catch up with every other country in the OECD and have a centre for disease control or an equivalent. And what that would recognise... Uh, is that we weren't as well prepared as we should have been for this pandemic. We need to learn the lessons from that and be better prepared for the next pandemic. This time around, we didn't have enough equipment. We were over-reliant on global supply chains. We hadn't run a drill for something like 12 years, and so we need to learn from that. We need a Centre for Disease Control, which can manage the stockpile, interact with the states and with global best practice, uh, run the drills, uh, be on top of this situation so that if... Uh, heaven forbid we get another pandemic of this scale or even worse, uh, that we're better prepared for the next one than we are for the last one. The so, vaccine so how, is... would having, how would having a Centre for Disease Control actually change uh, the scenario we're in currently? Well, it would change our ability to interact with manufacturers of equipment. It would uh, better be able to manage the stockpile of equipment. Uh, it would be a permanent... Uh, body which would interact with the states and with global best practice. It would run those drills which are really important and haven't happened Is that uh, right for a dozen yeah. years. I, look, so, so, so Jim makes a really important point. Um, in my day, we actually did practice for these things and the stockpile was created when I was secretary. But there's a thing that he's missing. Um, one of the things that we know is if people are saying a 100-year event, well, let me tell you, it could happen tomorrow with another virus. And we know that people are living more closely together and that makes us more vulnerable. But we don't invest in what we call the priority pathogens, the things that are at risk, because there's no market in them. So the, the CEPI that I chair, one of the reasons we were set up is to actually spend money on these pathogens that we worry could turn into this kind of event. So the other thing we need to do, and Australia needs to be part of this, we need to make sure that we tackle this pandemic with all of our effort and all the science that we can muster. But at the same time, we need to spend money actually preparing not just the stockpile, not just the logistics, but that we do the research work on these other pathogens that we worry about. OK, let's take our next question. It's from Raymond Trow in our studio. Oh, thanks, Hamish. Um, the higher education sector not only contributes to the intellectual capital of this country, it also makes enormous economic contribution um, to, to our country. We see job losses and reduction in courses or program uh, in the sector. My question to the panels are, how do you think the higher education sector will contribute to the economic recovery and why is the federal government refusing to save the sector? Jane Human. Jane Hume, you're refusing to save the sector, according to Raymond. No, not in the least. In fact, I think we're doing an awful lot for the sector. In fact, we've guaranteed them $18 billion in funding this year. Obviously, the universities, and let's face it, they're multi-billion dollar institutions. If they were listed on the ASX, they'd be in the top 200. You know, these organisations have relied very heavily on international students in the past, and yet they haven't risk managed for uh, the potential loss of those international students. That's why we've, we've uh, provided them with $18 billion worth of guaranteed funding this year to get them through the crisis. We know that you, they've you lost some staff. You did cut them out of keeper, that though, with respect. Staff. No, no, actually, the university's qualified for job keeper if they met the criteria. Uh, we know that... Yeah, you um, made the criteria too hard lost, for them to meet. Well, we know that they have lost around 2.4 
4.5% of their staff. Now, the rest of the economy has lost 4.2%, so they've actually been disproportionately uh, affected on, on the upside. What we have done, though, and I think this is important, is establish the Job Ready Graduate Program, which will increase the number of university places next year. And, in fact, it will increase the number of university places by 100,000 places by 2030. And it will make getting a university degree much cheaper uh, for around 60% of students, either cheaper or it will stay the same. And it will prepare graduates for the jobs outside in the workforce, the jobs of the future, whether they be in teaching or nursing or science or, 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 or IT. And it's not just the courses either, it's the units within courses. So even if you do a course that doesn't necessarily meet that criteria, you can pick electives that will make your degree much cheaper. Let me bring Naomi Simpson in. Do you believe in this job ready idea? Do you think the changes being made are actually going to mean that employers can take more people on? I think that all the universities are very different stages of how they engage with the community they serve, which is also the businesses and the, and the corporations. I know UT, UTS, for instance, has a very robust um, internship and uh, program with You have some involvement Australia. with UTS. Yes, well, it, it is across the road. It's not very far. So, yes, um, working with them. But I also work with the University of Melbourne in the Business and Economics Faculty. And one of the things is that undergraduates there see small business or being business owners as an attractive career path, which is also something that traditionally they may not have looked at. And that is a very valid uh, career. So there's a, a lot of conversation from uh, the likes of Scott Galloway on how um, tertiary education is about to be disrupted because it is, it is expensive for young people to start in our society with a debt and then home ownership and things become even harder, especially if it's a long journey to find something in their career. The more that business can work closely with tertiary ed education, so what is it that businesses need? We need data scientists, we need programmers, we need U UX, we need logistics. You know, let's look at what we really need a lot of and so how do we So signals to students, do you think that's the answer? Uh, pricing for students. Price student. signals, make it more expensive to do the things where the jobs aren't. No, I don't think so. I would hate to think that curiosity and people's ability to learn is limited only by an economic outcome or a job. Otherwise, we'll never discover anything new. Okay. So Bruce that Chapman would be not the role of tertiary institutions. However, I do think that the, 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 the outcome has changed from pure academia and research to how are we supporting but we community. Also, but and we also need research. Jobs. We, we actually also need, need the research sector in universities and we need business to actually work with universities as well. So there's the student outcome, which is really important, but where's our prosperity going to come from in the medium term? Mm -hmm. And partnering between business and universities. If we lose the research, those early researchers, they'll never come back. So I think there's another priority we need to focus Can on. Can I just say, Bruce Chapman, who is the father of HEX, has done the modelling on the government's policy and says that the pricing will do nothing other than disadvantage some students and, and advantage others. It won't actually change people's choices. Our next question tonight is a video from Kath Murray in New South Wales. I still get emotional listening to I Am Woman. It makes me feel proud and powerful. I was reminded of it when Helen Reddy died this week. I think what it means to be a woman is different for every woman, and we should take pride in that. Sometimes I actually feel sorry for men and the struggle they have and the limited definition of what it is to be a man. I'm so grateful to the women that have forged a path that allows me and my daughter to be the women we want to be. My question is, why and how are these lyrics still relevant today? Uh, Nikki Hartley. Um, this is hard. I, I wasn't really familiar with Helen at, at the time, but um, I'm very proud to be a, an active member and on the board of One Million Women, which is a, a, a climate and sustainability organisation. Everyone sign up, please. Um, and that, that collective voice of women making decisions every day to make a better environment, women are, we are absolutely amazing. And despite all the problems that you raised earlier tonight, we just keep going and we don't give up. So a fantastic anthem that is as relevant today as it has ever been. Joan Holton. Uh, I, I remember first hearing this um, and seeing my mother's copy of the female eunuch um, on a table <laughs> in, the, in the living room. Um, I was just before I was a teenager. It's really, really resonated. And when she sang this at a rally, uh, I think after Trump was elected, um, it resonated just 
just as much. And I think it would also be a shame, uh, Hamish, if we didn't also acknowledge Susan Ryan, mm. another domestic leader for women. Uh, and it is a shame. A Labor politician. A Labor politician. Um, uh, but it is a shame that these lyrics are as relevant to us today as they were, you know, in, in that time and that we haven't made more progress. Uh, Jane Hume. I love this song, not just because I can belt it out at karaoke, but uh, but mainly because of that <laughs> that sense of empowerment that it gives women. That it's not about sort of whinging; it's a, it's about strength, and uh, and that's what I, I think I love about it most of all. It's not about uh, you know equality of outcomes; it's about equality of opportunity, which is so much about what this government's about too. Jim Chalmers, is this your feminist anthem? <laughs> 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 Look, I think it was really sad to see uh, Helen Reddy uh, pass and in the same fortnight that we lost uh, Susan Ryan and also Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, I, I knew Susan Ryan. I didn't know Helen Reddy. Uh, I was... Uh, uh, Susan Ryan was someone that I knew and admired greatly. Mm. When it comes to that song, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, Jane Hume belt it out, <laughs> but uh, when it comes to that song, uh, we played it for my little three-year-old daughter, Annabelle, uh, over the weekend. Uh, trying to explain to her that the women that came before her and also to my little boys as well. And I think it's remarkable all these years later since that song was released, uh, the impact that it has on, it has on people and the opportunity it has uh, for all of us to remember the contribution of women like Helen, like Susan, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg and so many others. Uh, Naomi, one final thought. Yes, I remember my mother going off on her business suits to work in computers and I just wanted to be like my mum. And when I heard that song, um, mum, I didn't know, and I said, and she said, she's Australian. And I remember being so immensely proud of being Australian. And she said, you can do anything. Right. And I always have followed her words of wisdom. Well, uh, we're pleased that you've done that. Uh, just stay tuned for the music. That's all we've got time for tonight. Please uh, put your hands together for our panel. Nikki Hutley, Jane Hume, Naomi Simpson, Jim Chalmers and Jane Holton. Please thank all of them. Uh, thanks to those of you here in the studio and you're at home for sharing your stories and questions tonight. Uh, and thanks to those of you streaming us on iView as well. Uh, before we leave you tonight, a quick word. We did ask the Federal Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, to join us next week in a one-on-one -on -one to answer the steady stream of questions that you're sending us on these unprecedented economic times. Uh, he did decline that request. Uh, throughout the year, we've also invited the Prime Minister to join us on several occasions. Uh, he's yet to make himself available, but we will continue trying them, uh, trying to get them here to answer your questions. We know how important your questions are. Next Monday, the opposition leader, Anthony Albanese, will be here. He's unveiling Labor's policy agenda in his budget reply on Thursday night. So get your questions in early. You can also register to join us in our studio audience. To close tonight, it's my great honour to introduce Mahalia Barnes and her band, Ben Rogers and Clayton Dolly, backed up by an all-female choir formed just for tonight. Prinny Stevens, Joy Yates, Juanita Tippins, uh, Lyric McFarland and Rebecca Jensen. They are strong, they are definitely invincible and they're here to pay tribute to the one and only Helen Reddy. I am woman, hear me roar In numbers too big to ignore And I know too much to go back and pretend Cause I've heard it all before And I've been down Shout.
Tom.